This is a presentation on ELMS Learning Network, originally given at Open Ed 2014. I am Brian Olendyke. I am the lead developer of the ELMS Initiative, a series of systems at Penn State University that's intended to uh, change the way in which you deliver courses. Michael Collins is also a member of the team. He's our, our user experience lead and is based out of a different college for me, which is the Eberly College of Science. I am from eLearning Institute and the College of Arts and Architecture. And so who else is involved? Because this is a very collaborative effort. Currently, there are five units at Penn State at the time of this broadcast that are exploring or actively starting to adopt Elms Learning Network. We're also on a small grant with a group out of the law school at the University of Wisconsin uh, called Center for Patient Partnerships, in which they've been using Elms Learning Network to deliver a few courses and are currently investigating a pilot for the law school. So what is this? Technically speaking, Elms Learning Network is a series of networked Drupal sites that form a course. We use automation and a technique known as DevOps or developer operations to keep the process manageable. New, fully configured Drupal-based RESTful web services are built on demand. In plain English, we want instructional designers and faculty and students to never realize that they're using Drupal. They should just be using a tool, but the way in which those tools talk to each other is over something called REST which allows for full access to the objects and resources within the different sites to one another. And so we want there to be new ideas. And when we take those new ideas, we bundle them up into a new configuration. We give this configuration a new address. And so this gives us a new tool for faculty and staff to work with to deliver course resources on. So this is a suite of tools approach to form a learning network based design for a traditional single point of entry. So why another solution in this space? Because we're describing something very different here, right? This is not just one system that you come to. This is not our LMS. It's a, it's a philosophy of design. But why another solution? There's so many already. Well, our space has a lot of problems worth solving. 99 or so, in fact. <laughs> Instructional designers and faculty have little influence over technological direction when using products from vendors. You're going to get a product that's effectively off the shelf, and then you're going to take it and use it with all of the assumptions and connotations that the develop original developers of that platform had. Well, when you have a lot of functionality in one place and you increasingly have less control over it, less ability to influence, make you more sad faced like this guy. Regardless of solution, satisfaction ratings for LMS technologies are often low. We don't have all the statistics here, but every one of you listening has probably seen a presentation about reviews of LMSs and migrations of LMSs. Let's me cut to the chase. They're all basically built the same. They might have a little better usability, but largely people are unhappy with them. Huge amount of time and money are being spent identifying technology solutions just identifying, right? Penn State spent two years deciding we were unhappy with all of the solutions that were out there, right? It's in two years, the entire landscape has shifted. Technology's moving so fast that we can't actually keep up with making long-term growth decisions. It's just not possible anymore. But what's not to love about the system? Now, we can easily take pot shots at this, right? It was 2001 or this you know, past year, but it's really, we're not just taking pot shots at this, right? This is a system that we have access to, but it really doesn't look that different, does it? We've still got a fairly consistent branding bar, if you will. We've got everything as far as interaction coming from the left-hand side. We've got the bucketing of everything you're gonna do to deliver your course down into these few categories. Is that the way you teach your courses? Is every course topic the same? We just swap out the faculty that's behind the material and it's pretty much the same, right? Because the technology is the same. No. So why are these platforms failing? To talk about that, we need to review the modern LMS, which as I just alluded to, is any LMS, unfortunately. 
And so behold, the one true tool that all of you will enjoy and all of your students will have a great time using. This is a single point of functionality. It's great. We've got all these features over here. Mail, roster, grades, collaborative tools, multimedia, the syllabus. So this is where everyone will succeed or potentially fail. Right? So I hope all of you like it because we're not going to make changes to it anytime soon. As I mentioned, it's one big system that does everything for everyone. But unfortunately, not everyone is going to like this. If you don't believe me, this is a picture of just some of the things that have been asked for over several years in the Canvas platform. And I don't mean to pick on Canvas. There's a lot of issues in a lot of platforms. And so instructors do this. This is, you know, kind of fragmentation, right? We get faculty and staff wanting to do new things. And so you're starting to see the LMS response to this as LTI, uh, where we take you from one place to another. And if we bridge it seamlessly, then you probably won't notice. But we'll still keep you in the LMS as our primary method of getting there. And that's fine for now. Um, but a lot of times people just see a new cool shiny thing and they want to use that they want to be innovative they want to be the ones that brought people to that space right to do something that maybe isn't lti compliant yet maybe is a little too cutting edge and so this stinks quite frankly um, there's personal identifiable information concerns or p2 um, you know as far as data retention security uh, user experience suffers because we have multiple logins maybe people are going to wordpress.com for some material maybe they're going to youtube maybe they're going to vimeo maybe they're going to random other service providers we get this very fragmented view of the world from a staffing perspective we're also trying to support unknown services and let's not forget accessibility because every platform you send someone to has to be accessible and so if you don't have control over the accessibility of a remote platform you are still liable for sending people there and so what happens if we can't solve all these issues what happens if we can't make everyone happy or even worse we're not allowed to fix them great things will still happen they just won't be implemented sustainably so let's try and move to a model where we support all types of students and instructors let's unlock our educators access to influence the technology and democratize this space that's traditionally a single point one-stop shop because learning technology needs to be designed for the unknown we don't know what the future is going to hold and so we need to design a system in such a way that it can provide continuous and tailored innovation and incremental improvements or, or not incremental improvements based on mass consensus, right? We want continuous and tailored innovation, not using the same thing for everyone, not assuming the same thing, making as few assumptions as possible, quite frankly. So how do we accomplish continuous and tailored innovation without going totally insane? Because we want people to be able to take and kind of do their own thing uh, and do that in a way that's sustainable when we just had a whole bunch of slides talking about how that's not possible. <laughs> so of course I'm going to say it's Elm's Learning Network, but not really. Um, it's the philosophy of design behind Elm's Learning Network. So this is just kind of the ways in which we've built this system. And I would recommend you use any system this way um, because we're selling you on a community, we're not really selling you on a product. So what ed tech needs to do in general in education is we need to get off the island. We need to look outside of our traditional sources for solutions to these problems because they're all building down the same path. Don't start from scratch though. I'm not talking going and you know, just start developing in PHP or Ruby on Rails tomorrow. We need to use web services. This is the easiest way to allow for continued, continuous and tailored innovation in this space. The rest of the world runs on web services. It's how your uh, experience is stitched together without you really noticing it a lot of times. And it's how bigger companies are able to maintain innovation over time. We need to hit automation at scale. So how we structure the systems can change, you know, so that they change now, and we need to make sure that they can scale to support things in the future. We can do this and make it manageable via techniques known as DevOps, where you're basically 
turning all sysadmin and developer operations, as it were, into code. We need to support personalization as well. So we can follow a pattern that then allows for people to do new and innovative things, but us still be able to maintain it and be sustainable. And so we get, this is what you get when you have more of a suite of tools approach to developing a system. That we're sending people out of a traditional silo, whether that's just a, an LMS or a data source, and we're sending them into the place where we want the, to go, where we have parts of the experience spread across systems dedicated to that part of the experience, as opposed to one system that needs to meet all of those needs. So what this looks like from an address standpoint is something like this. So we've got tool.domain.com in this case. And so when I'm on the blogging platform, I'm at blog.myuniversity or blog.mycollege slash the course in question. And so using this approach, taking the different aspects of the course and spreading them across a best of breeds approach, we can do things like this, where Science 101 doesn't it doesn't have blogging necessarily. It doesn't have our studio tools. Maybe there isn't interactive content that stops and asks you questions as you watch a video. And so maybe it uses these three systems. Maybe Art 101, completely opposite, right? Maybe we don't have a lot of media. Maybe it's a lot of production of media. Students submitting work, getting review, peer critique. Maybe it has engaging interactive media where there are content questions asked along the way. Maybe students are asked to blog or use an e-portfolio type of a system. Uh, we don't need to use the exact same series of solutions for the same courses, right? So this, this all you know, allows us to hit uh, load distribution in a better way from a you know, technical perspective, but can also deliver a much better course experience because we're focusing the course on just the systems needed to meet the job, or maybe new systems, maybe ones that aren't even on here using this network-based approach. And so each course is a network of systems in this way. So what the workflow kind of looks like, and this fortunately is one of the only slides that says Drupal, <laughs> is that we go to our center point, which we call CIS for Course Information System. That's our online.university.com, if you will. And so at the CIS, we can request a new course. But it's not just a new course. It's what tools are you going to use in development of this course. Each of those tools goes off and creates a new Drupal site. So we have people requesting Drupal sites to be generated without them knowing it's Drupal. A series of commands are run automatically and spin Drupal up in a way that's specific to that tool. That's that new configuration. Maybe that new type of Drupal site is a new idea at a new domain. We go out a little bit and we get a, you know, a new idea, right? A new tool is developed. It's automatically networked into the original course space. So we come back to CIS after the fact, hey, I've got this innovative idea coming from faculty member two, and we want to try this out in course space two. So let's build out that space and then network it into the rest of the setup. These things can now happen thanks to developer operations, DevOps techniques without much effort at all. So what about user experience? Because we are talking about sending a user across lots and lots of services, right? That's kind of the advantage of a single point, isn't it? That you go to one, one place and you have a consistent experience. And even if that experience isn't great, it's at least consistent. And we have everyone logged in one place and we know where we're talking about things. Well, for one, we can get data out of that system and into our network. So we actually use data from the LMS at this point. But really, that could be anything, right? If, if we have section-based information. If we know a student is associated to this course at this point in time, so they have access from January 1 till May 15th or whatever it is, and we know who they are, we know they're a student, then that's enough information to create a cohesive experience. And so we use single sign-on technologies with this little bit of data. Um, you use things like Cosign or Shibboleth to pass the user seamlessly between all these services. Now, this isn't a new idea. This isn't some crazy thing that's out there that we're pushing, which is why it's philosophy that's important here. This is what platforms like Google do. You have 
a different experience based on the application that you're using in their suite of tools. If you think of the Google ecosystem as a suite of tools, basically, as a learning network, right, that you're utilizing YouTube, and no one ever goes to YouTube and then says, well, what's my account again? When I click to docs.google.com or Drive or whatever they're calling it to these days, or if I go to Google+, Plus, or if I go to Google proper to search for something, right? I have a unified experience across all of these. Generally, the design is the same. Generally, the placement of my account information is the same. And in fact, when you, if you would click on your picture and then go and update your settings, the expectation is not that you've just updated your settings there, that you've updated across all of your applications, that your Android phone now has those settings. This is something Microsoft does as well, and I actually think does a more consistent job at this point, is that they use color to represent the type of application you're working with online. So in this case, we've got a bar across the top. I've got a little app icon, even though this is a desktop laptop application at this point, and I can click to the tool that I want to go to, or the tools themselves can reference the other ones, right? They know when I'm part of my email client that they have access in some form to my, you know, OneDrive SkyDrive account. And so that I can access photos there or I can upload things to my my OneDrive account directly from my email because I'm still me across all of these services. And so we can do something very similar if we're using a pattern, you know, just following a pattern. We have addresses in this case, things like online.elmsln.local as that address of what tool you're on slash what course it is. So you see we have studio, we have courses, we have interact, we have blog, all of these different things slash whatever the course in question is. And I know who you are and we've passed that data around as to what you what you can do that you're a student and that you're in the course at this point in time. We can give you a consistent experience. So what does this mean for OER? Well, for one thing, we have options. Content can be completely open on cloud-hosted systems, while more of the things like assignments, assessments, things that the university is really concerned about when it comes to personal identifiable information, can be hosted within our traditional walled gardens approach to systems. We can also use open content and copyrighted content and mix them together, but only show the appropriate material to the right audience. So what do we mean by this? Well, talking about contextually rewritten content, which because we're course centric as opposed to logistic centric system, we can layer the logistics, things like who you are and what you should see into the material instead of the other way around. So for example, we might have a video that's presented on a page as well as some text and a footnote saying, Hey, this is the copyright info associated with this. So for a current student, we know, well, you should legally be allowed to watch this video because you're in this section and you should have access to it between these dates. One day after the course, you know, is over, we can switch you automatically to a past student role in which we can still send you to the material, but we know now that we can't actually send you that video, which we were only allowed to use under the provisions of, you know, Teach Act, for example in which we can show you the video in the confines of a classroom setting, but you're no longer a student. So we can do the same type of a thing, but with open material. So instead of needing to actually go and take material, copy it to another location, sanitize it, uh, and then get it out the door, which is more along the lines of what happens uh, with other open, open systems and open educational resource movements at universities, we can actually use the exact same material. This opens up new avenues for other faculty to contribute to opening up their material when they might not have otherwise because of the barriers to entry. Something else that our logistics based, you know, logistics layered in approach gives us is we can tokenize. And so what we'll do is typically you go into the course content and when you're setting up a course, you might actually tokenize things like the dates, assignment title, instructor contact information, all of these things that are actually just logistics laid into the content. And so because we can do that, we aren't forced into abstracting them out. A lot of times people will 
for various reasons, take dates and kind of sanitize the material of dates and then put those in the syllabus and then reference, you know, refer to the syllabus or see date this is due in the syllabus. That's easier to manage, again, from the logistic centric standpoint, but it's hurting the user experience. So by pushing the logistics into the material, we can actually deliver a more personalized experience for the student. So what is some of the technology that's kind of powering this system, right? Because we said get off the island. This is, you know, open source technology to save education, save ed tech. Well, a lot of it is Drupal, but there's other things going on in here as well. This is kind of a visual just breaking down that there's a lot more to this than just Drupal. Um, there is a lot of things that we've developed for the system. Most of that has gone right back out into Drupal.org. So there's like 66 plus projects now that are shared on Drupal.org as a result of this initiative. So what has Drupal's impact been on Elms, right? Because it's a large part of it. We won't say that, you know, it's not impactful. Um, and this is one of the quotes that kind of illustrates why we use this technology. So I think there is great value in perfecting technologies which set out to eliminate the webmaster, the developer, and the designer. Now that was said by Dries, who is the founder of the Drupal project. And so this is an entire community, a whole ethos of we don't want to keep doing the same thing. So it's people that are kind of eliminating their job. This is a big part of DevOps and developer operations is how can we routinize things and make it so that it's something a machine does? Uh, because we don't want to go and write HTML across 10,000 web pages if you want to put 10,000 web pages on the internet. We want to do it in one place, propagate it out to all those 10,000 pages. This is a philosophy that we can kind of bring into every part of Elms. We don't want instructional designers and faculty to have to mess with HTML and mess with how do I embed a video. Uh, the, the technology should be seamless. It should not be something you have to learn how to use uh, because really you're just trying to portray uh, concepts and do it in a pedagogically significant way. Why are you fighting the technology in order to get this online? So what has Elms impact been on Drupal? Because I mentioned this is a community and we're a community member in this effort. Uh, well, code submitted for, you know, as part of the Elms initiative has been downloaded over 780,000 times and has almost 13,000 reported installs. So what does that mean? Well, it means that there's lots of Drupal developers out there using Elms Learning Network produced code as part of their job, as part of their websites and projects they're deploying. So they're checking the code, they're auditing it for security, they're finding bugs, they're adding new functionality. And so by tapping into this community, building on top of it, we've actually been able to get people that would never have, you know, would never be contributing to our system to start contributing to it and do so in a way that's still beneficial to them and you know, very beneficial to us. So we've got a huge developer base kind of through this by proxy relationship here. So let's look at some of the example systems that come from Elms Learning Network, what people have done with it. So PWIC is a, um, it's a PHP based analytics platform. It's kind of like having your own version of Google Analytics. And so we use it, you know, you can hook it up to your courses. You can see, hey, there's a lot of people in Music 109 in this example. Hey, my students typically come in around these times. This is an example of um, the MOOC platform, which is your courses dot, you know, university type of, of site. And so you see, we do stick to some conventions, right? So we have a top branding bar. We have, you know, welcome syllabus, help resources, these things abstracted from the material because they're kind of more logistics focused. Uh, we have our material on the left-hand column. As you can see, all of our material is responsive. So still, most LMSs are, are not optimized for mobile. That's like a, an add-on. That's something else you have to buy into. Um, everything we do is responsive. Uh, Drupal and the internet, quite frankly, outside of the LMS space has been responsive for a long time now. And so this is everything we do is responsive. Here's an example of taking the Elms platform and kind of tailoring it to your needs. So this is a course site for Center for Patient Partnerships. 
you'll notice it has like course news, it has quick links to things, it has forum topics, uh, recent comments, it's got a radically different theme from the one that we just showed. It's got, you know, things in a consistent location, but it's their consistent location, right? And it's a different series of things. So, I mean, honestly, what they're doing, they've kind of extended the platform a lot more into that traditional LMS space, but leveraging the fact that they can kind of build new spaces very quickly, you know, f customize them to their needs, things like that. So it looks very different. We'll go to one that Arts and Architecture uses. Again, very different looking from that one. This is Music 11. It's one of our courses. And you can see we still have our consistency as far as welcome, syllabus, help, resources, contents on the left. This is another one of our courses. We do a very similar thing, right? So this is for a Beatles course. This is our CIS system, which is kind of that uh, online dot, you know, your college or what have you uh, site. So this is kind of more of a marketing and promotional site to say, hey, here are the courses that this college or this program or this whatever, you know, unit is deploying this has. Um, it also is able to highlight faculty, has sample syllabi. This is where the logistics actually get programmed into. And so this site helps bridge those logistics to the rest of the network. The Studio, which is a tool we won an award for in the past, is um, it allows students to have kind of a social community in which they're submitting media and then doing an open critique process. So might go and give you know a thumbs up to you, might give you some five-star ratings, uh, leave feedback on your work, and then use that feedback in later assignments. So that's you know a separate system, very different scope and use case than you know the CIS, than the uh, the MOOC platform with the courses set up. And similarly, we have an asset management system, it's our media engine, another one we won an award for. And so by you can see we've got all these systems. We're taking the scope, making it specific to what that is, and then we're networking it together in such a way that it still makes sense. But now, you know, for example. Uh, the last few years we had a push towards HTML5, right? It's the delivery mechanism for video. It took an hour for us to update our asset management system to then deliver HTML5 based video into all of our courses. We've got 2000 videos, right? So it took a few seconds really to, to hit refresh. <laughs> um, that's not possible if you're going and you're manually working with HTML in courses and things. So let's take a quick look at the future. Where are we going from here? So we know the courses need a lot of stuff. And as we mentioned, we want to, you know, keep innovating, keep getting people out of HTML, keep getting, you know, use developer operations to automate things even further. And so what we're starting to envision is basically a system of content entry and creation that is completely devoid of HTML um, that allows you to kind of drag and drop and click and build responsive, uh, you know, responsive layouts, uh, use templates that are instructionally significant, right? Um, pedagogically focused, these types of things and be able to make it look really good and be really accessible without having to know any HTML. So we want to completely eliminate connotations of WYSIWYG, uh, if you will, which is what you see is what you get. Uh, kind of more of the Microsoft Word <laughs> copy and paste, if you will. We want to get away from that and more into the instructional significance of the objects on the page. Because content editors should never have to worry about accessibility. Uh, so if accessibility standards are built into the themes, if they're built into the system as a whole, and if they're built into the way in which you create material, then accessibility should just happen. Now, that's not to say that you don't have people auditing accessibility and helping ensure accessibility. It's saying they're doing more meaningful things than validating that your theme, you know, has the heading tags in the correct order, because that's something we can do. We can automate that. So now it's time for you to get your hands on. If you want to, you're probably watching this through elmsln.org, but if you're not, you can go to elmsln.org and get more information about the project, download the white paper, uh, see what some of the resources are, check out the other presentations on it. You can try it out in Vagrant. Um, if you're 
you know, a little more developer <laughs> centric, uh, which is a virtual server. So you can actually run the entire Elms Learning Network virtually on your local computer. Or you can clone the project and put it on a real server. So even if you're not a developer, you can absolutely contribute back to the project in meaningful ways. So, you know, even if that's just reading our white paper and passing it on to people, um, this is a community effort. Lots of people in the um, in the community have different skill sets and they can all help. So, you know, we can contribute graphic designs, uh, applying for grants and hiring, you know, developers or student developers like Wisconsin has building out themes. Um, there are also other Drupal LMS projects. So checking them out, seeing how we can, you know, combine efforts, see what's possible um, and just contributing feedback to our ideas and where things are going. Uh, Cause this really is a community effort. So in summary, Elms Learning Network is a technology and online learning innovation platform. It uses a suite of tools approach to L traditional LMS design, uh, and it keeps it from being chaotic via uh, developer operations because we expect that the world will change and we don't know what you're going to need, but we do know you're going to need a system that students can access easily that plugs into a seamless experience. And from there, we can build innovative tools. So if you'd like to reach out and contact us, I'm at BTO Pro uh, on Twitter or at ElmsLN is the Twitter account for the project or ElmsLN.org. Thank you very much.